Hi, I'm Alan Smith. With the arrival of autumn, it's time for me to clean up my garden and prepare it for next spring. One of the things that I do each fall that always yields the biggest and most beautiful reward is plant lots of bulbs. Tulips and daffodils, as well as other bulbs, are some of the easiest plants to grow. They put out such a spectacular show in the spring before many of the other plants in the garden begin to bloom. We have a special treat for you as we take you across the Atlantic to the Netherlands to see where many of the spring bulbs we plant each year get their start. We'll learn a little history about the tulip trade in Holland and how centuries ago growers could pay a fortune for just one little bulb. Also, we'll travel to New England to discover how tulips became so popular in this country. And did you ever think of eating bulbs? I'm not talking about a tulip or narcissus, but another bulb that's one of my favorite herbs, garlic. I'll share an easy recipe that calls for a lot of this flowering bulb. Finally, we'll take a look at some other bulbs you can plant in your garden for a variety of spring flowers. Other than the rose, the tulip has to be the most recognizable flower in the world. These days they're coming up everywhere in spring gardens. They originally came from the Near East, but about 350 years ago the Dutch brought them west and developed them into beautiful hybrids like this. This one is called Perestroika. It's a variety that I found in the Kuchenhof Gardens in Holland, one of the largest display gardens anywhere in the world. They literally plant millions of bulbs each year. According to Carla Tune, the director of the Leiden Botanic Garden in Holland, it all started with the color red. Why did people get so excited about this bloom 400 years ago? Well, you realize that spring flowers were mainly yellow and white. And here is a spring flower with red. So 400 years ago, the introduction of red as a spring color was a new idea. Yes, it was entirely new. It took the people and, and, and it, it warmed them up and they loved it and it was a new addition. And that's what they wanted to have in their gardens. And it's all because of this man, Carlos Clusius, that the tulip was introduced to Holland in the 17th century. You see, Clusius was a physician by profession but his true love was plants. He is reported to have brought the tulip to the Netherlands by way of Turkey and Vienna, eventually making his home at the University of Leiden, where he helped to found its botanic gardens. Little could he have known the impact tulips were about to have on Holland. The famous tulipomania, uh, that was a period uh, when tulips were sold in Holland for astronomically high prices, well, it ended with uh, some sort of a bust in uh, 1637. Um, well, uh, tulips had been sold since 1610 for higher and higher and higher prices, skyrocketing prices. And finally, there was so much falsification going on that the Dutch government put a stop to it. And then a lot of people were totally ruined. Give me an idea of how much people were paying for tulips in the 17th century at the height of tulip mania. Now there were some very um, beloved species like Viceroy and at the end in 1637 we know that somewhere around 4,600 gold guilders were paid for only one bulb of Viceroy. To bring this into perspective for modern Americans, if it cost 4,600 guilders then, uh, it's probably about 2,300 American dollars times 10, which would be about $23,000 for one bulb. Yes, that's true. So that's tremendous. And uh, now you can understand why people wanted to go in the tulip trade. Now, of course, the Viceroy is extinct now, but there are many other flame tulips or broken tulips that 
that uh, look similar, I guess. Now. That's true, yes, right. but in those days, what they didn't know, it was uh, a virus disease that made those broken, yes. or what we call Rembrandt tulips. One I of, see, yes. and here's one, but this is a modern That's hybrid. a modern, what we call a parrot hybrid, and that's a modern one, and that's no virus at all. It's hybridization. But some of those tulips that looked like this, that were uh, um, tulip, broken tulips, and that was by virus disease, and that is what tulip breeders or growers nowadays don't want to have in their tulip fields yes. because it spreads rapidly and it ruins your flowers. Since the early days, tulip breeding has come a long way. Now you can find them in virtually every color imaginable, so there's no reason not to have beautiful tulips in your spring garden. Up next, we'll see how tulips captured the imagination of Americans. So much of gardening is preparing for the next season. We plant in the spring for summer, all of those great tasting vegetables. And of course, in the fall, it's time to plant bulbs for spring bloom. Now, this is nothing you can wait until the last minute to do if you want your garden to look like this. While our appetite continues to grow in this country for all of those spring flowering classics, like these daffodils and tulips, the large majority of the bulbs we plant in our gardens actually come from the Netherlands. The Dutch established and have maintained a reputation for producing these beauties now for over 350 years. It seems strange to me to be in a warehouse on such a beautiful fall New England day, but this is where all the activity is going on. You see, this is one of the oldest bulb companies in America. It's the John Sheepers Company in Bantam, Connecticut. Jan Ohms, a direct Dutch descendant of the original founder, continues the tradition of providing flower bulbs to American gardeners. I can see you're really busy here at Sheepers, filling all these orders. Oh yes, and it starts in the middle of August, and it goes on until about the middle of November. And during that period of time, most of the, uh, we will have containers, and the containers a 40-foot trailer truck that can hold up to a half a million uh, uh, sometimes a million bulbs, and we put all the bulbs in, uh, in a specified spot on the floor so we know exactly where what is. Right. And then people go around with little carts, wagons, and uh, fill orders. Jan, tell me a little bit about the John Sheepers Bulb Company. The company was started by my uncle. Uh, actually, he was my father's half-brother in 1892, I believe. My uncle John, uh, he, he came out of uh, the town of Arnhem, um, and nobody in his family was in the bulb business, but somehow or another he ended up in it uh, and became very successful. In fact, he became known as the Tulip King. <laughs> in, indeed. Uh, and I think uh, one of the reasons was is that uh, at that time there was not uh, a whole lot of competition. And the other thing that uh, Uncle John did is he concentrated um, on where the money was. He just simply felt that uh, if you're going to make money, you've got to go where the money is, and that was with the very wealthy private estates that uh, abounded in, in, in those days. And Uncle John uh, would present himself at the front door of, of these, these large estates and, and talk to the owners of the estates and, uh, and book large orders. Well, he seems to be attributed to introducing the tulip in mass planting into this country. Yes, he did that, and uh, he did that through his connections uh, in New York City and people with the uh, were involved with the World Fair, and he was able to persuade them, I presume fairly easily, to uh, set a bunch of land aside where they could do a mass planting. Then, uh, Uncle John, being who he was, got the Dutch bulb growers to donate the bulbs. And this was probably one of the first times the American public had seen tulips planted in mass, I suppose. I, I am I'm sure of that because uh, how many people did tra were in a position to travel to Europe and specifically to uh, to Holland to see to, to see the bulb fields. I've seen some of the catalogs that you all produce now, but they're apparently quite a tradition in producing elaborate catalogs in the company. I would imagine that uh, Uncle John in uh, in his day probably was the first one to put out an elaborate catalog of uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 pages. Uh, with black and white photography that I think was touched up to show, to show the color. The flower bulbs have a lot of advantages. First of all, they give you color in spring when nothing else flowers, and uh, they're, they're fairly, fairly foolproof. <laughs> 
Yeah, what's amazing for me is that the bulb actually contains that flower that's, inside each yeah. one, and all you have to do is coax it out that's if you right. get the conditions right. You, if that's all you have to do. As you can see, a lot goes into bringing flower bulbs to market. And it's amazing to me that this year the Dutch will export over a billion bulbs into this country and that we will spend over $500 million buying them for our gardens. One of the questions I most frequently ask about planting bulbs is, should I pre-chill my bulbs before planting them? If you're planting daffodils, you don't have to pre-chill them. You see, most varieties will grow all across the country. However, certain varieties do better in the deeper southern regions. On the other hand, tulips, hyacinths, and crocus need a period of dormancy where they stay really cool from 40 to 45 degrees for a minimum of six to eight weeks. Eight to 10 weeks would be ideal. But if you live in a cold part of the country, planting your bulbs in the fall is all you need to do. But if you live in a warmer part of the country, you'll probably want to pre-chill your bulbs. The easiest way to do that is just to put them in the refrigerator, but don't place them near ripening fruit like apples, because the fruit gives off ethylene gas that can literally destroy the tiny flower bud inside the bulb. Here's another tip. When you're planting your daffodils, or any other bulb for that matter, don't put a commercial fertilizer like this in the hole and place the bulb directly on top of it. You see, you need to work it into the soil first. I even put a thin layer of soil between the base of the bulb and the fertilizer. You see, those young roots don't like to make direct contact with the fertilizer. It could cause them damage. I like to use some of the compost from my backyard bin when I plant as well. Not only does it give the bulbs a boost, it's free. And making compost is an easy way to take care of all that fall yard waste. Here are some other things to remember. Amend the soil with compost and bone meal. Mix well to avoid damaging the roots. Planting tulips in a wire cage helps protect them from ground burrowing rodents. Plant bulbs a few inches apart in groups of about a dozen for impressive spring display. Remove faded blooms, but leave the foliage to die back naturally. While daffodils naturalize easily, it may work best in your garden to treat tulips as annuals. If you're bewildered by the bevy of bulb choices, just check out my website at pallensmith.com for some helpful advice for your garden. Coming up next, we'll visit a place where the tulips never stop blooming. There's no question the tulip has to be one of the most popular of all flowers. Maybe it's because when we see them, we think of the spring. For most gardeners, it's the spring of the year when we see these in our gardens. But you know, these days, you can actually find tulips in just about any florist, whether it's in the middle of summer or, for that matter, any other time of the year. Have you ever wondered where these tulips come from and how they force them into bloom out of season? Well, it's thanks largely to growers like Lok van Aden of Holland, who specialize in producing cut flowers for distribution all over the world. Locke gave us a tour of his facility and explained the process he uses to trick tulips into bloom on cue 12 months a year. Now the process starts when you uh, put the bulbs out of the ground. Then you must wait. Till this would be in July? This is, uh, yes, uh, around the, four, uh, the yeah, 1st of July till the 15th of July. Depends on the weather conditions. Then you must wait till the flower is inside of the bulb and we uh, bring them into a space and uh, we bring the temperature around 20 degrees. That's the best temperature to, for the bulb. Right, which would be grow. about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. So during this period, the flower is actually developing in the bulb. The flower is, is uh, from nothing, uh, piece by piece, uh, is growing till he is finished. Once they're brought into a greenhouse like this, the growth accelerates. They're at this stage in the beginning, and then after one week, two weeks, three weeks, they're ready to harvest. We plant uh, 84 bulbs in the box. We give them uh, an, a lot of space. Uh, that's better for the leaves, better for uh, the quality. They have more uh, ground, more space, more air. That's better for the tulips. When you look at literature about planting tulips in the garden, it's recommended that you plant them, you know, six to eight inches apart. 
Mm -hmm. But here I see you're planting 84 bulbs in a small box uh, where they're very close together. Yeah. Uh, why can't uh, we plant tulips close together in our gardens like you do here in the glass houses? Uh, it's possible, but we must think about the cost. If we plant uh, instead of uh, 40, 84 tulips, uh, 44, it will be very expensive. But this for the tulip, the, uh, the more space, the more air, the more ground, the better. Luke, once the tulips are cut, tell me about the gathering of them. Uh, we tried a uh, bin of uh, inside an hour to put them on the water. It's my job. I, uh, I take them out of the glass house, put five on a bundle, put them in the water. I put a sticker on them with my name and the name of the cultivar. I see. And I put them uh, into the freezer. According to Luke, caring for tulips once you get them home is really simple. You see, all you need to do is recut the stems and put them in water. You may want to change the water about every three days, but the main thing to remember is give them plenty of it. When it's time to plant bulbs in the autumn, you're probably thinking about the traditional ones we've already discussed, daffodils, tulips, and hyacinths. But there's one bulb that I grow, not for its flower, but for the bulb itself, and that's garlic. Okay, maybe I'm stretching it a little, talking about garlic in a show about spring flowering bulbs, but how else am I gonna tell you about a great tasting recipe that combines 40 cloves of garlic with chicken? 40 cloves of garlic may sound like a lot, but the cooking mellows it, and it infuses into the chicken. It's definitely worth a try. I start by cutting two young friars into pieces and peeling 40 cloves of garlic. Place the chicken in a shallow baking dish, skin side up, tuck the garlic cloves around it. For extra flavor, I use about two cups of chopped celery. Now mix together one cup of dry white wine, a half a cup of olive oil, and one tablespoon of poultry seasoning. If available, include a half a cup each of fresh parsley and chopped fresh basil. After mixing it together, drizzle the sauce over the chicken. Then squeeze the juice of one lemon over the chicken and sprinkle on some salt and lemon pepper. Cover with foil and bake for 45 minutes to one hour at 375 degrees. It's delicious. Not to be left out of the spring lineup are the daffodils. These beauties are some of the first flowers to greet us in the spring. So how about a few quick tips on how to grow daffodils in your garden? With literally hundreds to choose from, I'm convinced the most difficult aspect about growing daffodils is simply choosing a variety. Some are now being bred with almost pink trumpets. Then there are the classic yellows of every shade and shape. Then, of course, my favorites, the pure and almost pure whites. When I plant, I try to find a place where I won't disturb them with too much digging throughout the year. I found that this space between my sidewalk and fence is a good place for them. Grouping a single variety of at least 12 to 15 bulbs makes the most visual impact. You see, here they get plenty of sun, and I can let their foliage die back naturally after they flower. I learned a long time ago that having daffodils blooming throughout the entire spring depends on how you select them. You see, different varieties flower at different times. So by choosing early, mid, and late bloomers, you can actually extend your daffodil season. Today, we've seen a variety of ways to enjoy spring flowering bulbs, everything from the remarkable tulip to the daffodil, and of course, that essential bulb for any kitchen, garlic. Of course, we've only scratched the surface of spring flowering bulbs. A few others I couldn't imagine my garden without are snowflakes, hyacinths, and bluebells. Now, just remember, if you want to enjoy flowering bulbs in the spring, you have to plant them in the fall. So get started and find a place for some of these in your garden today. 
Now, if you're looking for any of the ideas or recipes that you've seen in today's show, just check out our website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream Of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile